you know, I have a five-year-old at home, and he's getting to the point where we can begin to talk about, and he can begin to learn about Jesus' death and resurrection. And it's always a little weird with a five-year-old um, how to talk about something that's violent and something that's painful. And we were reading the other day in his uh, Jesus Storybook Bible, which is an awesome children's book. Um, I would actually encourage anybody to read it. We were reading through some of those passages, the stories, and he wanted to read the one about where Jesus was killed. And that kind of had me worried uh, that I was raiding, raising a five-year-old sadist. And I said, okay, why? And he said, because it's happy. And that had me really worried. And I said, well, why is it happy? He said, because Jesus died for our sins. And that is why we call Friday good. And so we're gathered tonight as an opportunity to pause and reflect that there are a lot of not good things that happened to our Lord and Savior, but it is good. Um, tonight's going to be very different. Um, I hope you're looking forward to it. There's going to be a lot of songs and scripture read. Uh, pastor's going to speak several times to us. But more than anything, our reminder tonight of the cross is that it is God's gift of love to us. That Jesus in his faithfulness and obedience to death, even on a cross, was God's message of love to us. And so for whatever, whatever speaks to you the most tonight, whether or not that's music or spoken word or prayer, I hope that you walk away knowing that this is God's gift of love to you. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we are gathered as your people, called by your name, rescued by your Son, sealed by your Spirit. And we are gathered on this Friday that we call good because of your love to us, your faithfulness to the cross, and your sacrifice for us. God, we thank you for your gift that you gave to us in your son. And as we pause at a busy week, going into a busy weekend, help us feel, to know, to sense, to hear, to read, to listen, to experience your great love for us. Amen. To tell the story of Jesus, we have to go all the way back to the beginning. The word of God says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We know that as he went through creation, eventually he came to the point of where he created man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils, and man became a living soul. From his rib, a woman was created. We know them as Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were placed in the most perfect place, in fact, the perfect place, the Garden of Eden at that time. The Lord told them, do whatever you want to do. But in this garden, and when you read it in the account in the book of Genesis, it's absolutely beautiful as, as it is written and the pictures that come to your mind. There are rivers, there are streams, there are trees, there are flowers. Some of the trees produce food. And the Lord told Adam and Eve, do whatever you want to do. But in the middle of that garden, there was a tree of knowledge, a tree of life, which was good and evil. And he said, do not eat of that tree. You see, when God created mankind, he gave within us a will that we could do whatever we want to do. It's up to our, we can make our own decisions, how we want to live our life, what we want to do with our life. He did not create us and make us as a puppet. And so, for whatever reasons, as the temptations came to Adam and Eve, they could not resist eating from the tree. And because of their sin that we know as the fall of man, every person from that day until this is born into sin. From that moment until today and until Jesus comes again or until we are in heaven, from that moment till this, every single person is in need of someone. And as God looked down upon those that lived in the Old Testament, you think of Noah's day, and he became quite angry and was ready to destroy the world. In fact, he did, except for Noah and his family. But here we are. Generations and generations later, as God has looked down, and as he looked down upon it in that day, 
as the people continuously to rebel against him and to commit sin. He thought, those people need someone. And it was in the divine plan of God that he would send his son Jesus into the world that eventually would die on a cross. You and I need someone. And that someone is Jesus. And so throughout all of the Old Testament, there were 332 prophecies that were given by the Old Testament writers predicting that the Son of God was going to be born, that he would die on a cross between the, the, the words were male factors, which were thieves, but he would rise again. And so the story of Jesus actually started at the fall of man because God loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus was God who came into the world by a virgin girl. We celebrate that day as Christmas. And what a time of celebrating we have in this church and throughout the world. And so when we think about Jesus, the prophecy of his coming, and then his birth, he lived for 33 years. But the word of God tells us when Jesus came into a world of darkness, he was the light of the world. From Luke 2, 8 through 11, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around, shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And then from John 8, verse 12, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let's stand and sing.
So Jesus was born. We don't know of him ever being quoted as saying anything in scripture until he was 12 years old. And then there's a reference to him speaking in the temple when his mom and dad were with him in Jerusalem and went out and each thinking the other had him and he wasn't. And when they went back, he was in the temple and was teaching and this, the religious scholars of that day were, all, were blown away with what he had to say. But as Jesus went through his life, let's fast forward it now to the age of 30. Because as far as we know, at least in scripture, there's not any word of him speaking from the age of 12 until he was in his public ministry. And then he was in Cana of Galilee. There was a wedding that was taking place. And they ran out of wine. His mother came to him and said, we're out of wine. Is there something you can do? And Jesus looked at his mother and said, my time has not yet come. I have to believe that Mary was quite excited when she heard those words because she said, he said, yet, not yet. Meaning, if he's not going to do something now, he will soon. We know that story as him turning water into wine. Jesus went on, the Bible tells us, doing good, performing miracle after miracle. He touched blind eyes and they could see, deaf ears, they could hear. He walked on water, he calmed the storm. He took two fish and five loaves and fed over 5,000 people. He raised the dead man from the dead. And yet through all of the things that Jesus did, I have to believe that from the time that he was cognizant and could realize he had the cross on his mind. He lived his life in the shadow of the cross. To try to get some kind of an implication of that, you be Jesus for a moment. And you know that you have come into this world for one reason and one reason only. And that is you will die for everything that every person has ever done wrong. Not just their deeds, but their thoughts, their words. When I try to put myself in Jesus' place, I'm wondering how many really happy days would I have had? And yet he was a proponent of peace. He told his disciples, he said, my peace I give unto you. So he was all about peace. But where he was divine, he was also human. And when he was human, he was also divine. But the humanity of Jesus I have to believe that as he thought about what lied ahead. Did he know exactly when? Well, he was divine, and I believe he knew everything, but, and if he did, then that would mean that every day that passed, he realized the suffering and the cross was that much closer. You try to imagine what your life would be like if you were living every single day knowing that there is a cross waiting for you.
This reading is from Matthew 26, 14 through 16. Then one of the twelve, the one they called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Thirty pieces of silver. Do you know what that was worth? It was worth a dead slave. The scripture tells us a gored slave. A slave that was dead. And so the religious leaders of that day felt that the value of Jesus was 30 pieces of silver. And that is what Judas gave to the high priests and the authorities because they said, we need to know who this guy is. Because all through Jesus' ministry, and I said we had fast forward to when he was 30 years of age, when somebody is walking around and he's healing people, the people that are sick, the people that are blind, the people that are deaf, there's going to be a following. And people were following him. And people were loving him. And people were having their lives changed by him. But the religious authorities of that day were very jealous of him. And they said, we've got to do something. Who is this man? And so the plan with Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, Judas agreed, what do you give me if I point him out to you? Jesus and his disciples were in Jericho. Three different times the Lord told his disciples, I'm going to die. The day will come and I'm going to die. And he told them, if you're going to be my disciple, you will die with me. And in Jericho, there's an Old Testament scripture that says that Jesus set his face like a flint. And that was his determination. That was his commitment. I am going to Jerusalem. I will give my life. And the journey begins. On his way, he passes a tree and looks up, and there's a man up in the tree. We know that guy is Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Some think that he was up there to get out of the crowd. There's others that believe he was up in the tree because he was so short he couldn't see, and he wanted to see Jesus. Everybody wanted to see Jesus, even if they hated him. They wanted to see him. He made many of them angry. So many people didn't understand him. At times, the disciples were totally confused. Who is this man? Jesus looked up in the tree and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. Today I'm going to your house. As he's walking a little later down the road, there's a man on his knees that is crying out and begging, and he hears the crowd and He hears a commotion, and he gets somebody. He said, what's going on? And somebody told him that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Jesus of Nazareth. And he began to cry out. He said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And all the people said, shh, be quiet. No, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy. And a third time, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus didn't ignore him. That's something about Jesus. He will never ignore a word in his direction. He will never ignore a plea, a cry. And blind Bartimaeus was desperate. He knew if he walks by me and he knows if I don't get healed by this man, I will be blind the rest of my life. By the way, He was healed, and that was the last time Jesus walked through Jericho. There is a time that Jesus will walk by every single one of us. 
there will be a last time. Now, I know we don't think like that. Because our mind processes will live forever. I'm going to have fun and do whatever I want to do. And, and, and this thing about church, this thing about religion, this thing about salvation, this thing about Christianity. And we look and we, we say, oh, the church, the Christians, they're a bunch of hypocrites and whatever. Maybe some are. But that has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with me because when it's all said and done, you can't stand before God for me. And I cannot stand before God for you. And so I can't be so wrapped up on what you do or don't do. But I am responsible for what I do. Jesus moves on. We celebrated this last week. Probably all around the world, churches celebrated Palm Sunday. Jesus, as he was going into Jerusalem, riding on a borrowed donkey, the disciples near his side, a large crowd that was following, and going into the, to Jerusalem, the streets were lined, and people were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king, and they th were waving palm branches, and they took off jackets, and they threw it on the ground. They were so thrilled. Ah, a king at last, because the Israelites wanted a king. Jerusalem wanted a king. We've got a king. He's here. Well, he was a king, but not the king they were thinking. What a day of celebration that was. And the next day, Jesus took a break, and he was at the home of Simon the leper. And the disciples were there. And a prostitute burst in on the scene. A woman of the streets. She came in, and she took perfume, expensive, and poured it on his feet and anointed him with oil. The disciples were indignant, and one of them said, why would you do that, this money? We, we, if we had it, we could have it and give it to the poor. And Jesus said, the poor you'll always have with you. This woman, I said, Bartimaeus was desperate. I believe this woman was desperate. Because Somehow, some way, I'm thinking, if I don't get to Jesus now, there's no hope for my life. Now it's Thursday. It's Thursday. Jesus tells a couple of his disciples, go into town. You see a man carrying a jar of water. Ask him if he has a room that we can meet at tonight. Carrying water, that would be easy to spot because women carried water. So if you saw a man carrying water, that's the guy. Jesus and his disciples are in the upper room. Jesus knows what's going down. He had already told his disciples before they entered Jerusalem, we're going to go into Jerusalem, I'm going to die. And in the upper room, the Bible says that they were reclining, probably lying down on their elbows on the floor. They didn't have the tables and chairs that we do today, the luxuries that we have. Jesus said, in this room, one of you is a betrayer. And one by one, they begin to say, is it I, is it I, is it I? And it came to Judas Iscariot, and Jesus said, you're the one. Judas left the room. Jesus broke bread, and they drank of the fruit of the vine they sang a hymn and then they walked out into the garden the garden of Gethsemane the Mount of Olives a place of just short wide snarly in my opinion when I was there the ugliest trees you could ever see Now, maybe in the summer or spring, they blossomed and they were beautiful. When I saw them, I thought, this is awful. And Jesus went with his disciples and he told them to stop. And then he took Peter, James, and John with him a little further. And then he told them, you guys stay here. 
And I love this phrase, Jesus went a little farther. Jesus always goes a little farther. He always goes a little farther. He goes a little farther to reach for you and to me and, and, and to every one of us. He always goes farther. And he prayed, and the Bible says, till great drops of blood fell from his face. And there he said these agonizing words. Father, if there be some other way, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He got up and he went back and got his disciples and they were walking out of the garden. And as they were walking out of the garden, there was probably a noise. He saw a lot of lanterns. I think one of the scriptures talks, there's probably between 800 and 1,000 soldiers that were there with lanterns and clubs. And Judas Iscariot walked up to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and spoke to him and called him friend. Knowing he was going to be betrayed by him and Jesus called him friend. Jesus calls every one of us friend tonight. You may not love God, but he sure loves you. He gave his son for you. And Jesus, or Judas Iscariot, kissed him on the cheek. And the Roman soldiers stepped forth and took him into custody. This reading, <clears throat> this reading is from Luke 22, 39 through 42. Jesus went out, as usual, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 47 through 50. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him.
It was his love that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me How deep a father's love for us. I tried to describe, and I know I can't do that, the feelings, the emotions of Jesus. But I wonder what his father was thinking. I wonder what his father was feeling. As he had looked down. And now, Father God knows that the days are about over. It won't be long, and he'll be to the cross. And yet, there's that thing in his heart and in his mind. Everybody needs someone. They need someone. They need a savior. They need a friend. They need a confidant. They need someone to guide them, someone to direct them, someone to help them. That might have been the feelings of God. When Chris and I were in Jerusalem many years ago, I'll never forget of going to the place of where they thought the crucifixion actually took place. And there was a huge mural that just almost, I don't know that it would cover this entire wall, but it, it seemed like it was that big at the time. And what it was depicting was Mary, the life of the mother of Jesus. It showed her holding the baby. It showed her walking with him as a toddler. It showed her, of course, as a very, very young girl. But through the years of the life of Jesus, you could see that still she was a young woman. She was a young girl, barely a teenager, when she gave birth to Jesus. And if he died at 33, she was still a young woman. But life seemed to have been so heavy for her. The stress and the pressure, I think of the verse that says that there was a time that Mary pondered these things in her heart. And it made me wonder, I'm the mother of God's son. I don't want to lose him. And as you looked at those pictures and going from one to two to three and on, and then eventually you saw her, as they were taking him and beating him and as he hung on the cross and then as they took him down and they lied him on the ground. I wonder the thoughts and the feelings of Mary 
I wonder the thoughts and feelings of God himself. Jesus had been arrested. He was now in custody. It was in the middle of the night, either late Thursday night or early Friday morning. And they immediately took him to trial, which was totally, completely illegal, because their own laws say that no one should be tried in the night. And Jesus went to three separate trials. They were trying to find someone that would bring accusations against them. And they couldn't find anyone. They said, they even lie about it. Bring a false accusation. And no one did. And then finally, two men came forward and said, well, you know, he did say he was going to destroy the temple and the temple of God and build it again in three days. That's good enough. And they went on and they, as daybreak began to come, and it's very interesting to me, of all of the people that he healed, the blind, the deaf, the lame, calming the storms, feeding the hungry. No one came to his defense. No one. And it makes me wonder, if you and I were there, surely one of us would have. Wouldn't you think? Wouldn't you want to? But on that day, no one did. And now Jesus was let out. The trial was over. It was daybreak. And he was going to be going to be crucified. According to the custom of that day, if somebody was going to hang on a cross, they could set somebody free. And they decided on Barabbas. We'll set Barabbas free. The cross is for Barabbas, but we're going to set him free and put Jesus on that cross. That's just like Jesus, isn't it? He's always dying for sinners. He's always taking the place of someone else. I don't know how far they got from wherever they were holding the court and the trial. But I don't imagine it was very far and somebody spit on him. Some men came and they hit him in the face with their fists. Someone had made a crown of thorns and they placed it on his head and they said, he claims to be a king. If he's a king, he needs a crown. Somebody said, well, if he's a king, he needs a robe and they put a robe on him. If he's a king, he needs a scepter and they stuck a stick in his hand. They mocked him. They pushed him. They shoved him. And then someone came and they stripped the robe off him. He was almost naked. And he was put to a post and literally tied to the post. And the Bible says a legionnaire came with a short club with nine leather straps. And at the end of those straps were pieces of stone or broken glass, metal. And he was commanded to whip Jesus. 30, 40 minus 1. Because it was believed anything over 39 would kill a person. Could you imagine as he went back and as he swung that, and would literally wrap and dig into his torso, into his stomach, into his legs. And when they pulled it back, the glass, the stones, and would cut and blood and the flesh of, of all of this. And, and it, 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 he was beaten so much, it, it was probably hard to even know that it was a man. But finally the beating came to the end. Can you imagine the pain and the anguish that he went through and the suffering that he had? But now it's time to walk toward Golgotha. There were three crosses in that day, or three types of crucifixion in that day. By the way, crucifixion was originated with the Persians. They thought, let's get the cruelest people on earth, and whatever they are, we'll hang them. And one of the 
forms of crucifixion was a straight stick with a, a pointed stick. And they'd just hang somebody on it and it would kill them pretty quickly. And leave it to some people think, that killing is too quick. We want to make them suffer. So let's hang them on a cross. We can tie their hands or we can nail them. And both ways were accepted. But if they were tied on, they would hang there for days. And it's possible that they would even hang there if they give them water. They could hang there for maybe a couple weeks or close to it. They would die of starvation if they got water. But they had decided that nails is what Jesus would need. The other crosses was a T-shape, and in two different forms. One would be just like this, where the cross, the horizontal, is down from the vertical a little bit. But then there was another one that would be like a capital T of where the cross was at the top. There are some people who believe that that was the type cross Jesus hung on, which would mean that his arms were straight up. The crossbar, Jesus had to carry. They said it was probably 660 yards from where he was to Golgotha. The walk to Calvary was underway. But Jesus had been beaten and bruised. Can you imagine this? And they said, you've got to carry it. Pick it up. And the Bible tells us that he would stumble and he would fall because he was so weak and lost so much blood. They estimate that that cross beam was probably 110 pounds. And finally, he stumbled and he fell again. And they said, let's get somebody to come and help. There's a guy over there from Cyrene. His name was Simon. Simon actually was the father of two disciples. Some believe that Simon actually became a believer after carrying the cross for Jesus. Simon carried it the rest of the way to a place called Golgotha, a place of the skull. The crossbeam was put in place. It was on the ground, I suspect. And now they placed Jesus on the cross. Do you know how they did it? They bent his knees. They took one of his feet and put it flat against the cross. And they put the other one on top and drove a long nail through the top. We think of the nails going in, into his hands. That's probably unlikely because in his hands it would tear the flesh and it would probably fall off the cross. Many people say that the nails most likely went through his wrist because there's bones, tissue. And there he was. Can you imagine if you were there? If you were there. And if you were in Jerusalem that day, you probably would have been there. And what would have been the sound that you heard and maybe even the noise that you yourself made? Eventually, the cross was set up. And there he was, hanging, for everyone to see, a spectacle. Everyone needs someone, and God gave that someone. It was his son, Jesus Christ. What would you have seen? What would you have heard had you been with that crowd on that day?
my cleansing this my plea nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious. All of this started because of sin. And God so loved the world because the world needed someone. And he sent his son into the world to die on a cross. Jesus was placed on that cross at 9 o'clock in the morning. At noon, the Bible tells us, that the earth became dark. On the cross, he had cried out, or he had said to the thief, because one of the thieves hanging on either side of him said, would you remember me? And Jesus said, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Jesus said several other sayings. At one time he said, I thirst. Some of the Roman soldiers took a hyssop weed and they put it in some cheap wine and put it on his lips. It was probably a bitter taste, but again, it explains the humanity of Jesus. As Jesus was hanging on that cross with his knees bent, this is extremely significant. Can you imagine hanging that way and with his arms up and his head, after the time goes by, and now it's three hours, four hours, eventually five hours, he can breathe in, but he can't breathe out without pushing up with his feet to get up high enough to suck in a little bit of air. Can you imagine the excruciating pain that he would have? And then his knees would probably buckle and he would fall back. On the cross, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The Bible tells us that God turned his back on him and it's believed because God can't look upon sin. And I believe that. But there's another part that I believe his son was suffering. What kind of a father would see his, father, see his son do that, or a mother? The anguish, the pain, the suffering. 
It was getting late in the day. These guys have to die, all three of them, because according to law, they couldn't be on, because the Sabbath was coming and they'd have to be down off the cross before sundown. So the order was given, go and break their legs. Well, they wound up breaking the legs of the thieves. But they didn't break the legs of Jesus because he had already died, fulfilling one of those 332 scriptures that said not a bone of his body should be broken. I want to come down here and turn around and I want to look at the cross with you. Can you imagine the Son of God hanging on that cross? He came into the world to be the light of the world. He brought light into darkness. He brings life into death. He brings hope to frustration. He brings faith to doubt. He brings calmness to anxiety. He takes away all fear. He was nailed to the cross as God looked down upon this world filled with sin. Everybody needs somebody. I will give you Jesus. When you're alone and afraid, I'll give you Jesus. When you've fallen into sin and you've gotten so far that you just feel that there's absolutely no hope, I'll give you Jesus. When you feel like your life is broken and can never be put back together again, I will give you Jesus. And as we look at Jesus on the cross, Oh yes, on Sunday morning we're going to come back and we'll celebrate a wonderful day because even death couldn't hold Jesus, but that did not eliminate the suffering, the pain that he went through for you and for me. God sent his son because he so loved the world. He loves you. He knows right where you are in your life right now. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. That is the greatest need for all of us. God felt we need a Savior. When Jesus was born, the angels sang in the shepherd field, a Savior is born today in the city of David. He can be your savior. Maybe there was a day that you walked with God and somehow things just got messed up. You don't know how. That's something that sin does. Sin always takes us farther than we want to go. It costs us more than what we want to pay. It keeps us longer than we want to stay. But God gives us Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that incredible gift, the gift of your Son, the gift of Jesus. I pray for every person in this room, for all of those who are watching by live stream, for those who will go to a podcast later, that God, wherever they are in their spiritual journey, if they need Jesus, Jesus is available. And through a simple prayer with sincerity, oh God, thank you for sending me Jesus. I'm so sorry for my sin. I need help. I've tried to do better. I've tried to do good. But God, I need Jesus. I need a savior. I need help. I commit my life to you. 
Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my life. Thank you for the darkness of my soul to receive the light that only God can give. We give you thanks and praise. Amen. If the ship of your life is tossing on the sea of strife, you need someone. And if you feel so all alone and your house is not a home,
It is finished. <laughs>